Welcome to Four Quarter Lives, a podcast exploring the profound impact of longer, healthier, and more engaged lives, not only for ourselves and our couples, but also for companies and countries. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and on this week's Four Quarter Lives, I talk with Pedro Patella, head of people and culture for Sanofi in Brazil. He's also the head of Sanofi's ERG, or Employee Resource Group, on longevity. He shares with us why and how Sanofi launched a global network called Generations, what he's learned about longevity running it, and how the concepts of aging differ across cultures and countries. If your organization is thinking about longevity, this is a great case study of how to start the conversation. Pedro Pitella, welcome to Four Quarter Lives. Delighted to have you with us. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Aviva. So before we start, maybe we should introduce your company a little bit just to give some context and background. Tell us a bit about Sanofi. Most people will have heard of it, but its mission, just how big a company is it, where it's headquartered, and when you joined it, perhaps. Well, I joined Sanofi seven years ago in my current job as people had uh, Brazil. People had means HR head. Sanofi is a French pharmaceutical company among the top 10 pharmaceutical companies globally. It's headquartered in Paris, France. We... Always a nice place to be headquartered. That's a good global headquarter <laughs> for most people. <laughs> Absolutely. I love Paris. I love Paris. We are 50 years old as a company, already 50 years old, and we have 100,000 employees worldwide. We operate in more than 100 countries with 70 plants, and we have four global business units. So it's a very diversified company, ranging from vaccines to consumer healthcare to general medicines up to specialty care. I mean, rare disease, oncology, immunology. So it's a very diversified company. Fantastic. Okay. Having lived myself a long time in Paris, I know it well. So uh, lovely to connect a little bit through this. And so I'm curious, when, how, and why did the discussion about age, generations, and longevity start at Sanofi? Is this a new topic? Has it been around for a long time? As a global ERG, we started in March 21. So we are almost two years old. And when I say we, I mean we have five global ERGs. Generations Plus, that is the ERG. I lead globally. You, you might want to just explain to our listeners, not all of whom are corporate, what an ERG is. Okay, sure. ERG stands for Employee Resource Groups. That's the way we organize our uh, diversity, action, inclusion strategy and action plan. So we have five employee resource groups, five ERGs uh, globally. And we also have those five ERGs at local level. The number of ERGs, how we are structured locally, changed from country to country for many reasons, context, legal, etc. But the, at global level, we have those formal five ERGs. That connects with our global DNI diversity and inclusion strategy. All five global ERGs started at the same time two years ago, almost two years ago, in March 21. Although the local ERGs, they may have been operating locally longer. Right. Today, we have Generations Plus, that is the ERG I lead, in 21 countries. So from North America to Brazil, from Australia to Korea, from South Africa to France, from UK to uh, Russia. We have 21 local ERGs. This network is amazing where the real work happens at the local level. The five ERGs, just to mention all of them, besides Generations Plus, we have Gender Plus, we have Ability Plus, we have Pride Plus, and we have Culture and Knowledges Plus. So those are the five global employee resource groups. Fantastic. So just curious, what happened in March 21? We were right in the middle of COVID. What happened in March 21 that suddenly you went from a mishmash, I guess, of a lot of local ERGs to suddenly deciding it was time to unify and globalize the five? It's an evolving story of how we approach DNI globally. As a company, Sanofi has been evolving how we approach uh, DNI. Yep. And that was a milestone because when we welcomed a new 
Chief Diversity Officer that structure a global COE, a global center of expertise, and then the global ERGs were structured. And again, it is not something that has happened all of a sudden. The GNI work has been, you know, very active in Sanofi for longer, but that was a milestone when the five ERGs were formally launched with five global leaders, that structure, a clear strategy. But generations, for instance, we have had generations ERG in UK, for instance, for many, many years. So each country has a different story, different needs, different priorities. So at that was a moment in time that we said, okay, we need a global orchestration. We need a kind of governance so it can be even more impactful. Okay, so I'm, I'm fascinated to hear that Generations actually then started with all the others. So that's not like it's a new topic. It was really begun at the same time, but that it actually has its origins many years ago in the UK any idea why the UK got started early just because it's a hot topic up here? It's a hot topic. Frankly, I don't know which local ERG is the longest. I know that, for instance, the new ones are France. France is one of the new ones. As a matter of fact, the newest one. North America is a new one. But we have some local ERGs that have been there for many, many years. UK, I said, Australia, Italy, Germany. Lots of fast aging countries. So <laughs> that shouldn't come as a surprise. So tell me what's been done. It's coming up to two years old, I guess, just about. What's been done? Who's involved? Has it had any impact yet? What are you seeing? And what have you learned on this journey? A lot. I have learned a lot. Well, <laughs> first of all, what's our ambition as an ERG? Our ambition is to embrace people of all ages. So it's not only older or younger, it's embracing people of all ages. But obviously, we have a different priority depending on the country. You know, if yeah. you go to Japan, it's yeah. different from UK or, or France. So in Japan, our gap is how we attract younger talents. Because this is a very unique country with a demographic that is very unique. If you come to Brazil, my hometown, I'm talking from Sao Paulo, it's the opposite. How yes. we keep our old employees longer in the company, how we attract older employees. So the challenge changed from country to country. But what we have in common is the demographic is changing, regardless where you are. So how we cope with this changing? It's yeah. interesting because the other day I went to chat GPT and I asked the five big trends that are shaping the humankind? Very broad question. And ChatGPT came to me with six, seven uh, global trends. GNI is one of the global trends. Other global trend was longevity and yeah. the demographic shift. But what attracted my attention is that when I read the description about GNI, ageism was not there. It reflects our global conscience about diversity. It mentioned, obviously, sexual orientation, gender, but no mention about longevity. So although demographic shift was there as a big trend, so it's a paradox. Yes, it's a paradox. It's also relatively new. I think it'll be on all the DNI agendas within a few years. I'm sure you agree. But it's kind of rising up, don't you think? I think your company and your experience is a good indicator. That yeah. uh, and that's precisely why when we started the ERG, we put four big, big priorities. One is increase the awareness of AGs. Yeah. That's one of the four priorities. We said, well, we don't know what we don't know. So yes. let's start very slowly, first educating Sanofians about what's AGs. Myself, I didn't know about AGs a few years ago. So educating, creating awareness, AGs mean the agenda. Yeah. It's very important. The second priority was to nurture the local ERGs, you know, increase sharing, reapply, best practice. The other one was engage with external stakeholders. We have to learn. So how yeah. we engage with external stakeholders, what we're doing now is one example of that. Yeah. <laughs> and the Delighted to serve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
And uh, the fourth one is to change our practice, our policies to become a top employer for people of all ages. And that's very difficult because policies are very local. We have global policies, but local policies, legal framework. So we are evolving country by country, slowly changing the traces of age bias in our policies. I'll give an example, very tangible example. A few years ago, we were discussing here in Brazil, it says Brazilian example, our pension plan. The pension plan, the company match stopped at 60 years old. Obviously, we changed. It's not <laughs> anymore there. <laughs> yeah. But it was something that we realized because we had created awareness about ageism. Otherwise, maybe we didn't note the clear ageism in this policy. So changing policy, changing systems is very important. So those are the four priorities we have at uh, the Generations ERG. Tell me, fascinating. I mean, and those sound like very good first steps and pillars that every company would do well to be listening to you. Give me a sense of your own story and background. Why did you get involved in this topic? Did you have a big birthday or something? Um, what is it that you've learned aside from the existence and pervasiveness, perhaps, of ageism everywhere? And also, has your own view of age and aging evolved in the work that you've been doing and the conversations that you've been engaged in over the last couple of years? It was not a big epiphany. It was not something that, you know, all of a sudden realized. It was a evolving story. Well, this year, I will become 60 years old. Congratulations. Uh, it's a great you. age, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. I'm expecting that. Very <laughs> happily expecting that. Maybe five, six years ago, when I was already 50 plus, I started to feel the symptoms of ages. But I didn't yeah. know. People started to ask me, are you going to retire? You know, or oh, you look good for your age. All <laughs> those microaggressions, you know, that <laughs> but I didn't know they had a name. But it started to annoy me. And then I was there as an HR leader. I started to study. I joined some HR heads, colleagues in HR practice, and I realized that I was a privileged person. Being what I am in Brazil, I'm mainstream. I'm a male, heterosexual, cisgender, no disability, so middle class. I was not aware that I had so many privileges. So I started to feel guilty, really guilty. And I said, well, I cannot be guilty for the rest of my life. So I decided to turn guilty in responsibility. And being HR head of a multinational company gives me a lot of tools and, you know, space to impact. And I said, well, guilty is not what I'm going to feel. It's going to be responsibilities because I didn't know it was my marriage or life lottery that brought yeah. me here. Yeah. So I started to be an ally. Then I became an advocate and Nowadays, I'm an activist. So two years ago, I volunteered for this ERG, to this Generations Plus ERG. Before that, I was very active here in Brazil with uh, local NGOs. So it was an evolving story of discovering my privilege and deciding to change what I can change in my position with the tools I have. Fascinating. I love the journey from ally to advocate to activist. If we could get more HR leaders on that journey, that would be fantastic. And it has to be that way because, well, maybe someone has this big epiphany and will find something very interesting all of a sudden to engage. And it also connects to how we engage leaders because the ERG work cannot happen without engaged leaders. It's not someone that we do alone. We need allies. We need sponsors. We need to engage leaders. We need to build a business case. So there are many reasons why we engage or how we engage the business leaders, but we have to engage them. That's my personal story, how I felt passionate about the topic. That's fantastic. And I couldn't agree more that one of the crucial issues on all of these dimensions, but now particularly on the generations one is how do we engage leaders? So before I move on to kind of how you set up the ERG, I'm just curious, what's the business case? What have you built? What have you found? What's your one minute pitch when you're engaging with colleagues or with the external world on the business case for intergenerational everything in business? 
maybe it's not one minute, but uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You got it. <laughs> the well, business what? case. <laughs> what I keep saying is that not only generations, but all GNI spectrum, people get motivated for maybe one of four reasons. One, social justice. People get passionate about social justice, having a company that goes beyond the PNL and, you know, making a social impact. The second reason is talent. And being a HR head, I couldn't say anything different. You know, if you want to have the best people with you or the right people, best, quote, quote, you have to attract and retain people and people want to work in companies where we have psychological safety that people can feel okay. The third reason is compliance. And sometimes compliance quotas are necessary. Yep. And the fourth one is PNL. Why not? PNL. If you look at your consumers, in our case, patients, customers, they are from all ages. So if you want to address the market with your product, to your service, you have to think about age. And it's not age for younger or older people. It's ageless products. And you can pick one of those four strategies to convince the leader, but specifically about generations, what I keep saying is that we have another paradox. We mentioned a paradox a few minutes ago, but there's another paradox. When I look at the markets from my HR standpoint is I see a lot of older talents in the market that need to work because we are living longer and we haven't create our saving accounts. So sometimes, in, particularly in emerging countries, yeah. it's a reality. Yeah. So people that need to work. Second, people that can work because we are living longer and we are living better. So we can work. And the third, we want to work because work means health, social health, physical health. So it's very strange because we have a lot of 60 people like me that need want and can work. But when I look at the other side, the companies, we are absolute ignorant, absolute unconscious about that. Yeah. Our practices are still very ageist. And it's strange because our talent pool is shrinking. The younger talents are shrinking. And the other side, there's a big lake that is increasing of 50 plus. So it makes no sense. It's another paradox. HR leaders like myself, why we keep fishing in a lake that is shrinking while on your side there's a big lake and the consumer, shopper, patients, PNL case. So it's kind of changing the mindset from scarcity to abundance. Because if you think about it's an unsolved problem, let's solve it innovative ways. So the business case is if you want to keep the sustainability of the company, if you want to make a social impact, if you want to attract the best talent, they are all age. If you want to address the vast majority of your market, ageism, longevity, generations is a high priority. Okay, so like many of these business cases, it seems so obvious to you and me sitting here that especially the twin sides of the same coin, that consumers and customers are aging fast all over the world, and that talents, as you say, are ready and waiting to work. And companies are really seem to be not adopting this very, very quickly. So I'm curious, you've got a pretty clear business case, and I imagine you've been running around the world sharing it. How has it landed? And do you find when people hear it, are they convinced? Is it an easy sell or are you finding it bumping up against people's deeper ageist reactions? Reality, it's an easy sell, but yeah. harder to implement. People immediately connect, immediately connect. But how we put it in motion, how we put it in practice, it's not easy. Again, let me use statistics from my home country, from Brazil. I was born in the 60s, right? So in the 60s, the life expectancy in Brazil was 52. Today is 77. So I saw, not in 100 years, in my life, I saw the Brazilians gaining 25 20 years. years. <laughs> 25 years, more 50% of life. That's what amazing. Going, <laughs> how, what a what gift. Going to, <laughs> what a gift. Yes. <laughs> And our number of kids per family 
came from 60.3 to 1.7. So do the math. The population is aging. So people don't deny that. People yeah. connect. Maybe they are not aware. When I say those statistics, when I mention those statistics, people connect, they understand, they realize, they say, yes, I understand. I was ignorant. I was not thinking about that, but I understand. But how I can change? Because I don't know if you agree with me, but maybe the age is the least known and the more social accepted yeah. bias. The last acceptable ism, we say. Yes. yes. We keep joking, you know, and then it's very hard to connect minds and even heart to hands and say, okay, let's change. Let's do real change, impact. So it's a bumping road. When I propose some changes in policies, changes in practice, it's not always easy, but it's doable. And in those two years, we have progressed significantly, both at global and local level. Can you give us some examples? What are for you the biggest or most important policy shifts that you've sold and gotten accepted? Well, from a policy standpoint, it's much more local than global. Okay. Uh, because the reality, you know, life happens yeah. at local level. One is the pension plan that I told you. It's a Brazilian example. But to have a phased retirement in Australia, we have a certification. We recently got that is from an age-friendly institute in North America. It's a CAF, the name of the certification that is age-friendly employer. We have a talent bank for people of all ages, so in particular for 50 plus. So people that go to our uh, talent website, we see there are several different talents bank that you can drop your CV. And one of them is for 50 plus people. Yep. So we have launched policies to get women that they have stopped their career to take care of their family and they are returning to the marketplace. So we did that and sometimes combining with culture and origins. So you can pick from here, there are good examples of practice that started to emerge. And what is very rich is that the local EIGs are exchanging those best practices and trying to adapt to their realities. And again, the reality of UK, Japan, France, Brazil, or Mexico are completely different. What is Hot top in Mexico is not the same in New Zealand. Absolutely. The cultural differences and the demographic pyramids must be fascinatingly different across the geographies that you're watching. So tell me a little bit about starting an ERG. How did you go about it? If companies are listening, what advice might you have? And what obstacles, if any, or unexpected reactions did you bump into? I would say that the first step is to have a sponsorship. In my case, in our global generations in Sanofi, we have our chief digital officer, member of the XCON, our sponsor. What is a gift? Because common understanding is that older people don't get along with digital. <laughs> Having the chief digital officer is very symbolic. Yes, that's us. very good. Yeah, that's a good one. That, you did good there. <laughs> So have a sponsorship and in November, last November, I was in Paris doing a global webcast, internal webcast for our employees, Sanofians, along with our sponsor. And it was amazing. 3,000 people connected, live, and I much more watched the webcast later, recorded. And to explain the basics, what is ageism, what is our strategy, create awareness. So this sponsorship is very important, you know, it's very important. So I would say that is the number one. Number two, have a very clear, ambitious, but tangible strategy. I said our strategy has four elements, so you have to have clarity on those strategy. And then measure, yeah. you know, measure, 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 and keep moving. In our case, our KPIs, we are under construction of the KPIs, but the KPI is gap between our internal population and the active working population of a given country. It's not a global KPI because it's impossible to have a single KPI, but we decided to start with a very basic one. How close or how far we are if we compare our internal population and the external population of a given geography. 
where are the gaps? So we started to educate ourselves. Can be so, a- for example, do you mean that if any given country, 70% of 50-year-olds are working, you want that same kind of proportionality in your own population? Exactly. Okay. Precisely. So identify the gaps and then that country can have a specific tactic to close the gap. Right. And it's not only a picture, but a movie because the populations get older. So you have to be very smart, not, you know, being trapped by the current statistic of a given year. But how is the story? How yeah. it's evolving? Because we are planning for 10, 15 years ahead. Yeah. So measure is very important. Obviously, if you have local settings of other KPIs like a policy that I can change or being inclusive. And there are some intersectionalities. Uh, that's another very important strategy, how we work together in the five year years. There are intersectionalities with gender, intersectionalities with ability. So sometimes we can join force to be even more impactful. Can you give me an illustration of the gender? Because I'm always very curious on gender differences and generational overlaps. You mentioned that you're picking up a lot of women who may have had a bumpier Q2 first half of their career, and you're recuperating them in Q3 and developing. Are there any other dimensions that you've discovered that have surprised you on the gender age overlap? Yes, a beautiful example, because it was not only gender and age, but also culture and origin, because we did that for black women. Yep. So it covered three dimensions. Three dimensions, yeah. And it was in Brazil. And in Brazil, we have a very significant gap between our internal and external workforce in terms of, you know, race and ethnicity. So that's something that we took care. But there are, I'll give another example, how we can have health well-being policies that cover different needs. People that are taking care of older parents. So how we cannot start being very innovative in benefit policies, not only providing health plans, you know, life insurance, but also ways people can have to take care of older parents. So in gender, we have, and it's very important that we take care, and I learned from you, Aviva, that we have to be very careful when we talk about gender, not to put women on spot again, because we have men and women with different needs. And that's it. We have to list them. What yeah. are the needs? How we can ensure that we have in our health plans hormone repositions, for instance, you know, how we over andropause and menopause all together. People are, maybe it's a taboo. It's still a taboo in the corporate life. People are yeah. maybe afraid, and again, depend of the country, but people in general are afraid to tackle those topics. And it's getting more and more okay to talk about that and cover those needs. Especially for a pharmaceutical company, you guys should be the front lines of being able to talk about this internally, since I imagine you're selling a few products that address them. Absolutely. And people feel comfortable. That's my end goal, that people feel comfortable to talk. Those are topics that previously were uncomfortable to talk because then we can do something. And again, change a health plan. We did that. We included hormone reposition in our health plan. And this idea came from, you know, conversations. Yeah. Conversations that we are finally able to have in a very natural way. And is any of the learning, I'm curious, on the talent side, on the people side, is it informing in any way your customer facing side? Is this feeding through the other part of the organization towards the markets? Yes, it's strange because we are always thinking about life in very unique, very specific quarters, as you said. No? Yeah. And it's becoming much more not a straight line. I'll give you my example. I'm an engineer. I started in sales. Then I went to trade marketing and I have been in HR for more than a decade. And people are reinventing themselves, reinventing their careers successfully. So how we in HR, and now I'm talking not only as a generational leader, but also as an HR leader, how we can have training, career that allow people to reinvent themselves 
and getting more from their life in terms of work. It's not just that you retire or you do something after you get 50, but you can do this along your career yeah. in different stages, not age, but stages of your career. So it's very new. Companies are started to let it go career path, job descriptions, and started to embrace skill designs. It's very new, very few companies, some of you are starting to develop that at global level. How we are going to design careers, training, talent management in terms of skills. And skills, it's yeah. not something that you can say, okay, you are 20, so you have this type of design of a career. So that's something very new. That's the ultimate frontier, how we can allow all of us to have different careers and reinventing our careers and having an impact for many, many years. That's fantastic. Yes, I think the holy grail is to shift away from ages towards exactly that kind of skills and true meritocracy that we always talk about and aspire to. But very rarely when we start digging in on the age front, do we discover it's yet been implemented. So congrats. This sounds like a very innovative piece of work. I'm curious if you're a couple of years into this now. Are you seeing the lessons that you're learning spreading into leadership within your own organization? Are people starting to get some momentum on this and traction inside? And are you sharing it externally? Do you hear colleagues in other companies starting to develop some kind of parallel programs to yours? Yes, I'm very happy that although we started later in terms of, you know, diversity strains, and it's easier for us because diversity, equity, inclusion conversation is not strange anymore in the corporate world. So half, full half, empty glass, but although generations, ageism started later, we found a paved path in terms of how we can address the conversation. And more and more companies are starting to look at that because of the business case, because, you know, the diversity, equity, inclusion conversation is already there. So we can take advantage of that. And there are different ways to do that. Sometimes it's just a conversation. Sometimes it's changing the policy. I have seen companies that are like Sanofi. We don't ask age when we see the curriculum. In some countries, it's illegal to ask that. But in the countries where it's still yeah. possible to ask, the companies volunteering are not asking age anymore. Are very careful when designing a job description when, for a job post to remove all the bias, not only gender bias, but also age bias, number of years of experience. Of course. <laughs> Telltale <Now>, signs. <laughs> So this is something that talent acquisition organizations in different companies are still asking, but some are rare and they are not asking anymore or asking or requesting a number of years of experience. So I see more and more companies doing that. I'll give another example of Brazil. I saw statistics that 95% of the company of a survey of certification had gender ability pride. Only 50% of the companies had generation as a strain of diversity. So you can say, oh, only 50. But the previous years was only 35%. Yeah. So the percentage increased 15%. So the biggest change from one year to another. So the conversation has started and it's advancing very fast. And again, it's a business case. I'll conclude by asking you if companies are listening who haven't at all started on this journey, what advice would you give them? How best to start? Well, starting by moving fast as soon as possible. Don't wait to have everything completed, everything neat, everything perfect to start because it will never be perfect. So start by getting a sponsor. A sponsorship, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, it's essential. So get a sponsor. Second, start by small victories, changing one policy, creating awareness, starting the conversation, get in touch with other diversity strengths that are already there that can give you some help to structure your ERG. But having allies and structuring ERG is something that is very important. And don't forget, don't make it very complex, very broad, global. Always think global and local because the impactful changes are going to happen at local level. 
And finally, what should an individual in a corporate learn about this topic in order to manage their own lengthening career? What advice would you give them? I'm going to quote my colleague, Dr. Alexander Kalash. He's a doctor that came with this idea of four savings to have in your life. You know, the first one is money. You have to have your financial savings to provide you safety, security, so financial savings. The second one is health savings that you can really, really get to your 50, 60 in good shape. And we are doing that. The third one is your cognitive savings, lifelong learning that you keep curiosity that you keep not only your work, but a broad range of topics that keep you yep. learning all your life. And the fourth saving is the social saving, profound, significant relationships that you give you a sense of connectivity, purpose. So those four saves, that was I learned. That's what the majority of people in Sanofi, 50 plus like me, are learning. Because when you get to this age, You feel energized. You feel like you can continue to have a contribution and you have to have those four savings. Pedro, I think that's perfect. I see a piggy bank getting created with four slots for money, health, brain, and relationships. So you're a wonderful example of four. Thank you so much for joining us on Four Quarter Lives. And best of luck in 2024 with getting this scaled across even more than your existing 25 countries. Thank you, Aviva. It was a pleasure to be with you and thank you for inviting me. We will keep track of what you do next. For more thinking about the impact of our four quarter lives, you can read my column at Forbes and subscribe to my Elderberries newsletter on Substack. Let's design lives that aren't just longer, but better.